everybody. Um, thank you for joining DataCon 2021 uh, and welcome to the panel Elevating Data Equity in Practice. My name is Bob Neustadt and I'll be your host and our co-host is Priya Chauhan and she'll be here in just a moment. Um, so we'll, we'll be moderating the chat and QA for your session. For those in the live audience, you can find the chat and QA to the right in the Hopin uh, screen. And, uh, and that's the way we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, so day, today we have uh, a panel moderated by Rachel Wally, uh, Data Equity Program Manager at uh, LA Tech for Good. And without further ado, I'll hand this over to the moderator. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel today. Um, so I first want to just provide a quick sort of definition of data equity. I think it might be new for some of the folks in our audience. Um, and so I want to start with a quote from a resource called the Feminist Data Manifesto, which says that data is a thing we make and put to use. We can make and use it differently. So sort of the background I would provide on data equity as a topic is just that data is not inherently objective. Someone decided at all phases, you know, whether to collect the data, how to store it, um, whether, how to manage consent, who and what is represented in the data, um, and whether to even use the data when making a, a decision or whether to use part of it. And so equity in data is starting to center equity in all of those decisions and at all of those steps. So building mechanisms that are equitable, um, especially working to prevent harm, reduce harm, um, particularly when harm is disproportionately affecting a specific group who may or may not be represented in your data. Um, and so at LA Tech for Good, so we're a nonprofit here in Los Angeles, and we have been bringing people together who work with data. We use the term data practitioners, so folks who work with data in all different ways in all different industries um, to start to talk about okay, what is data equity and how do we actually bring it from theory into practice? And so the panel that we have for you today um, is an awesome group of folks who've all come together through our data equity workshops at LA Tech for Good. And they're gonna talk with you all about um, how they've kind of brought data equity um, into the work that each of them do. Um, so I'm gonna have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, so they're gonna tell you their, their name, company, role, um, and what got them each interested in data equity to begin with. Awesome, let's start with Ebony. Yes, hi Rachel. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me today. My name is Dr. Ebony Dotson. I am the founder and CEO of Healthcare Strategic Consultants here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I have been working in, I have a healthcare background working in quality, patient safety um, and quality improvement um, for over 20 years. But I recently found interest in data equity after taking LA for Tech for Goods cohort um, earlier this spring. Um, and I found that many of the concepts and principles around data equity were transferable um, to the work that I'm doing in healthcare. So I'm excited to be here and talk more about um, data equity in practice. Thank you. I can go next. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ava Pereira. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the City of Los Angeles. Um, and like Ebony, I also participated in uh, LA Tech for Goods Data Equity Workshop. Um, so really excited to be here today to speak to you all. Um, my pronouns are she, her. All right, I can go next. Um, so my name is Kathleen Wolterman and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm calling in from Los Angeles today and I am a senior consultant at CGI, which is a large consulting firm with offices around the world. Um, and we've got a focus in systems integration and IT consulting. Um, and I first got interested in data equity upon the recommendation of a book called Invisible Women, which focuses a lot on data biases and data gaps that disproportionately affect women in all different areas, um, from healthcare, urban planning, uh, education, career trajectories, et cetera. And, um, 
it really got me interested in, as a technologist, what I can do to fight back against that, um, just because it affects so many different areas of our lives. And um, from there, I got in interested in LA Tech for Good's um, equity workshop as well, uh, which really continued to spark my interest. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Maria Khan. I go by she, hers pronouns. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California. And I'm currently a research and data analyst at Advancement Project California. We are a nonprofit that focuses on racial justice and equity via data-driven research, advocacy, and policy. Um, equity is something that, you know, in a larger sense, I've always wanted to be a part of that conversation, coming from my own background of being a Muslim American immigrant woman in this country. I whatever space I'm in, I'm thinking about the equity in that space. So whether that's the policy world, the data world, that's a part of the conversation that I want to make sure we're having today. So yeah, I'm really excited to share this stage with all of these um, incredible leaders in the field today. So excited to jump into the conversation. Awesome. I'm so happy to have you all here today. Um, so let's get into it. So um, you all touched on data equity a little bit. Um, data equity encompasses many areas. We've got data ethics, AI ethics, data set creation, equitable data practices, um, using data to promote broader equity goals. Um, and so I think for this question, Maria, let's start with you. Um, what area do you see as being kind of the highest priority for the data community, both here at DataCon LA, but also more broadly? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and when we think about the different areas that you can kind of apply data equity and kind of ethics in this space, and there's so much that data is going into. And the more that like data is becoming a part of our everyday kind of use, there's so many different places that I can go. Um, I think one of the places that I like really want to see um, being like you have data start to be used is to promote kind of some of those like broader equity goals. Um, and I think the reason that is a really good place to kind of start is because when you're thinking of kind of goals as like your setting base standard of this is what we're going to focus on to try and promote data equity, you're starting in the right place. And hopefully that then is a ripple effect to all of the other areas that kind of go into um, the different pieces of this field in terms of data equity. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in kind of starting with having equity goals, no matter what your project is. So whether you're working in the healthcare industry in you know, the transportation industry and in the tech industry, whatever it is, but being able to have those equity goals at the front and center, um, I think will serve you well. Awesome. Thanks for that, Maria. Um, Catherine, Ebony, Ava, anyone else want to kind of chime in on areas you see as the highest priority for um, the data community as we think about data equity? Sure, Rachel, I'll jump in here. Um, I really wanted to kind of highlight or focus on um, equitable data practices, um, specifically as we think about um, healthcare um, for me, which is really my lane. Um, but I've been searching for sort of what does that mean? What's the definition when you really think about equitable data practices? And I think um, it's synonymous with data equity itself um, in that it's um, one of those things where it's complex, it's multifaceted, but it refers to sort of the consideration of ways in which data is collected and analyzed, interpreted, all of those things in one, but it also underscores how marginalized communities um, and unequal opportunities kind of present themselves through the data. Um, and I think it's our responsibility to really hone in on that and change that so that we do have equitable practices when dealing with data. Um, I think it's hard for us right now to really say um, that we have been doing that, or that's been the trajectory of the way that data, data is used, um, particularly um, in healthcare, which is, again, where my expertise lies. But I think as we begin to think about those things, we have to underscore some of the key um, principles relative to data. And I think, Rachel, you mentioned one in the introduction is that data is not objective, right? It's not solely objective. But a couple of other concepts that um, 
come to mind for me that we need to consider as we think about data equity is that it can create or perpetuate a power dynamic. Um, and so we have to think about that and really um, consider some key questions like who um, are we collecting data for? Um, why, do, why do we seek this data? Um, what's the dynamic between the um, sort of question asker and the question answerer? Um, so those are some key components. And then lastly, um, I would say that equity needs to be addressed throughout the data life cycle. Um, and so we know that there are uh, several stages that data goes through. And so we have to consider equity in all of those places. Um, and so really thinking about, um, I think we all count really um, outlines those seven stages of the data life cycle. And so really um, placing equity front and center in each of those um, aspects is really important. Yeah, I can touch on data ethics as well. Um, so data ethics are that these are the behaviors and norms that guide, um, you know, how we collect, manage, and use data. Um, and I think, you know, the goal um, for any organization should be to uphold and protect civil liberties and minimize risks to in individuals while, you know, maximizing the public good. Um, especially for government. Um, so I, um, you know, I think there are a couple, there's sort of like a framework, I think that's helpful in keeping in mind whenever you're working with data and you want to promote data ethics. And that's generally to just like be aware of um, regulations and professional standards for working with data. So just make sure you're staying up to date and you're current on, you know, what's changing in the field. Um, be honest and act with integrity. Um, so establish some, some sort of a process for reporting data ethics violations or concerns. Um, I think that that process is gonna be really important to have within your organization. Um, be accountable and hold others accountable. Um, so, you know, be aware of who the data stakeholders are and have, have them sign or have folks working with the data sign data use agreements. Um, just so you're clear on how the data will be used. Um, and finally, you know, just be transparent, like make sure you have communication with data stakeholders so they know how this is being used and how they'll be impacted by it. Um, so there's a great um, federal government framework that I'm happy to share in the chat. Um, I think it applies to a lot of different contexts. So I'll drop that in the chat in a little bit. Yeah, and um, all the panelists have covered a lot of really great uh, resources. I'm really excited to see that framework, Ava. Um, for me, it always comes back to that core data set as well. Um, whenever we're looking at building out an algorithm or working on an analytics project utilizing data, it always comes back to the core data set. And it kind of goes that saying, um, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Um, so if you start with a biased data set, then everything that is coming from that is then going to be biased by that original data set as well. Um, so in addition to what everyone else was saying, um, of course, there's considerations about the, the collection of the data, um, about who the data represents and how it might affect those people. And, and also in the case of um, if there's data gaps within the data, um, who, um, how this can affect people who are not represented then by that data. Um, and then, of course, to um <clears throat> excuse me uh just you know looking at all the different facets of um how that was collected and um and um how you're looking to apply it as well thank you all so i think we've kind of hit on a bunch of different areas of data equity that cut across all different industries as you all have touched on you're joining this conversation from a variety of different fields um so i'm wondering if you can each talk about and maybe ebony let's start with you um where do you see kind of the biggest opportunity specifically in your field to implement better practices around data um well rachel i'm glad you asked and i, I really think um as i was Thinking about that question and, and doing a little research, um, it still centers on equity. Um, you hear a lot um, about healthcare, um, health inequities, um, disparities in care, 
um, things of that nature. And this year marks the sort of 20th anniversary of a couple of uh, very prominent publications in healthcare. One is to Air is Human, um, Building a Safer Health System, and the other is Crossing the Quality Chasm, a New Health System for the 21st Century. And in each of those, um, the pillars that were outlined, equity was a primary pillar um, that has yet to really be addressed um, in healthcare. We are still missing the mark greatly. Um, and I think that we've seen that highlighted um, when we think about the pandemic and all that COVID-19 has brought to bear um, in terms of the U.S. health system. And so one of the things that I would like to see us focus on, and, and there was a new paper that was just released, um, I believe it was on Wednesday or Thursday, from the National Academy of Medicine, where they again highlight equity is the thing um, that really is going to bridge the gap and um, alleviate the issues that we kind of see currently within our healthcare system. But we can't do that without being able to address um, a couple of key things. Um, one of those is um, sort of lack of data. Um, and one of the reasons that we have a lack of data is the fact that there's a lack of trust um, that exists within our um, healthcare system for a number of reasons. Um, and so when we think about those things, in addition to addressing um, racism and discrimination that exist in healthcare, um, and also tackling the social determinants of health, um, and all of those really um, rely heavily on data, right? Um, and so as we think about that and think about the ways in which we gather data, analyze that data and interpret that data, and then make decisions um, as a healthcare system, I think equity still has to be the thing that we focus on. Um, so I'm glad you asked. I'm happy to jump in from the uh, public sector perspective and more specifically, I think the local government context. Um, so one of the ways that I see, um, I guess, a big opportunity for data to um, improve my field would be in just, I think, in the most immediate sense, just improving our programs and services. Um, so, you know, figuring out, you know, we have these programs and these services that are available, but where is uptake particularly lagging and what sort of outreach do we have to do to, you know, raise awareness and promote access to the program. Sometimes it involves changing the materials that you're advertising the language or materials that you're using to advertise the program. Um, we have lots of different languages being spoken in Los Angeles. So, you know, by using data to figure out where uptake is really um, lagging, you can start to improve um, awareness and access to programs and services. Um, I think we can also most immediately improve just internal operations and make sure that our city looks like and reflects the diversity of our residents. Uh, so I think that's another uh, way that we can use data to improve the field. Um, and finally, and I think most importantly, policy change. Um, my hope is that we use data to drive policy change um, because that's to me where the lasting impact is, is had. Um, I can go next um, talking about it from a more corporate perspective. Um, so we've got about 80,000 employees around the world. Um, so for us, one of the big opportunities and for other companies of our size is promoting education amongst our staff and the concepts of data equity. Um, in particular, since we all, all are working um, with technology or, you know, to be honest, we're all affected by these technologies and algorithms in our day-to-day our -day lives as well. Um, it's been one of our first tenants as we're expanding on our data, data equity program to um, expand the education with our staff. Um, so one way that we did do that is we created a, a customized four week long workshop along with Rachel and LA Tech for Good um, that was split between um, lecture style as well as hands-on activities. And it was really exciting to see the ways that people are looking to apply it to their day-to-day -day life um, or daily work too as well um, and the different insights that they're able to come out with from that. Um, and that also then ultimately helped inform our corporate strategy. 
Um, and also leads to more accountability as well as the more of our staff is uh, aware of these different frameworks, aware of the different questions and perspectives that they should be looking at whenever they're working with data. Fabulous. Thank you all. So I think what's really exciting for me when we bring these cohorts together is that we see folks like this group coming from all different industries, but all the kind of topics that you just touched on, even within your own industries, they certainly resonate for each of the others. And so I think that's just points to the fact that there's a lot here, there's a lot to dig into. Um, and there's a lot to do with kind of actually and I also want to, yeah. Can I add something to the conversation Please. before we move on, Rachel? Um, I wanted to just touch on this before we moved on. I just like something I picked up from each person talking and um, you kind of started with that, Ebony, and I, I really appreciated that you brought up the conversation of trust because I think that whenever you're going to talk about this big word like equity, um, you know, and we're going to continue to say this phrase <laughs> again and again throughout the next, you know, hour or so, um, but just thinking about how we need to kind of balance both of those together in all of these different spaces that we're in. Um, you know, Ava, you started talking about like programs and services and um, being able to kind of look at and notice for the communities that you're kind of responding to and like where that goes into. And it's like defining, you know, equity for us and like the nonprofit sector is always looking at it from a lens of how can we kind of empower those communities that we work with to use data um, the way that we are trying to, you know, put it out there. So like when Catherine started talking about like the training and things like that, I think that just goes so hand in hand with, you know, yeah, let's do those like internal um, trainings and um, hold ourselves accountable, but also how are we kind of representing ourselves as kind of these, not just data holders, but also like these data sharers and being able to mm -hmm. um, have the people kind of on the outside, um, you know, brought in to the data world and have them really have equal voice, equal representation um, within the data spectrum. But yeah, I just really wanted to touch on that because I, I really enjoyed hearing that piece of trust in every conversation that we just had um, on that question, but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. I mean, I think that has to do with democratizing data, with building transparency, with ensuring that kind of all stakeholders have a level of data literacy and access to whatever data or tools you're creating or using. I think that's super important, um, Maria. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, so not to not to turn us in a, a bit of a negative light, but it can be really really tough to implement some of these these ideas, right? Where the trust is a huge word, right? That's one of the things we're kind of trying to implement, um, along with kind of some practices and and protocols to follow um, to make sure that we're we're kind of using better data practices. And so I'm wondering um, if each of you could talk about some of the biggest barriers that you've seen or that you're sort of anticipating um, as you're actually implementing more kind of equitable ethics data practices. So Ava, maybe we can start with you for this one. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, at the city, and I think this is true for any large organization, um, sometimes there can be just like a lack of organizational process and protocol around managing data. It can be very, it can vary widely by department and team and silo and um, so just ha establishing standards and practices, I think, is, um, you know, a real challenge, um, but one that needs to be taken on um, and taken on seriously. Um, and then I would also say for us, I mean, just getting access to quality data that's disaggregated um, so that we can start to do some analysis and, and see, you know, if we're having disproportionate impacts uh, in our program services, in our policies. So just getting just the very first step of getting access to that quality data is sometimes a real challenge as well. Huge challenge. I'll jump in here, Rachel. Um, I think I alluded to um, a couple of things as opportunities in my previous response, um, but I wanna kind of hone in on the lack of data. And I'm going to actually read this directly, but this is something that I ran across when I was, again, kind of thinking about the questions. Um, and it reads, unfortunately, emerging technologies have the potential to reinforce inequities in healthcare quality. 
the implementation of artificial intelligence, for example, can reinforce racial and ethnic disparities to its reliance on historical patterns that arise from a biased and inequitable healthcare system and algorithms. Data used to train AI systems may be further entrenching disparate care through algorithms that are supposedly dispassionate but likely reflect pre-existing and well-established human prejudices. For example, despite mounting evidence that race is not a reliable proxy for genetic difference, some physicians are race-adjusted algorithms to perform patient risk assessments and guide clinical decisions. So when I read that and I think about um, healthcare and all the things that I've seen in the 20 years that I've been doing this, and certainly things that predate that time frame, um, it's a repetitive cycle that we get lost in. Um, and the lack of trust um, that really impedes our ability to get um, solid data is a huge concern. Um, it's one of the biggest barriers I see um, in terms of really showing or having equitable practices within healthcare. Um, and we have a saying um, in healthcare, um, what gets measured gets improved. Um, but often what we're measuring is an incomplete picture um, because we don't have all of the data that we need or that is necessary to really make informed decisions. Um, and so as healthcare leaders and policymakers, we have to advocate one for strategies that improve health equity, um, particularly for marginalized individuals, um, black and indigenous people of color um, specifically. Um, but we have some obstacles there um, that still present some really daunting challenges when we think about collecting accurate um, and comprehensive um, health services data um, because these individuals are the individuals that are more likely to experience sort of the inadequate um, episodes of care, right? Um, and that is further perpetuated when we think about the LGBTQ TQ, um, population as well um, because we don't readily collect um, the information that we need. Um, and so this data gap is really complex and it's multifold because of a couple of things um, to me that stand out. Um, and one of those is that we don't have standardized data categories. Um, and then we have some um, insufficient institutional incentive um, for getting um, the right information. Um, and then again, going back to sort of that lack of patient trust um, there's still that reluctance there. Um, and then there's a reluctance on the part of clinicians as well um, to really ask the questions that get to the heart of the information that's really needed um, to make the necessary decisions. So those are just a few um, of the obstacles or barriers that I see um, from the healthcare lens um, that I think we have to work on in order to get better um, and then close sort of the health equity gap that exists. Thank you for that, Ebony, and really scary to start thinking about some of the, the possible applications that you just mentioned where they were sort of relying on this historic data where we know there's huge equity issues. And obviously that exists in every sort of industry, but I feel like for healthcare, there's a, especially as we are all living through this global pandemic, I feel like there's an especially uh, scary, scary piece there. Um, Maria, I'm wondering if you would be willing to chime in a little bit. I know that your organization is um, kind of working really specifically toward racial equity and kind of ties to what Ebony um, just touched on. Yeah, for sure. Um, with the work that we do, we're always looking at race as a component, a factor, a variable. Um, you know, we're, we're not trying to kind of, you know, beat around the bush to kind of what the inequities, inequities are, where we're really trying to look straight at it um, and try to figure out kind of what's going on. And and even in that kind of work, you know, exactly what like Ebony talked about, like quality of data, and specifically when we start thinking of like data disaggregation when it comes to racial and ethnic groups, um, that's a huge barrier into our work, because while we're doing our best to kind of address and highlight where we could see some of these um, inequities between different groups. We also have to question, um, okay, like, does it, you know, do these categories even encompass like all of the different um, diversities that we have within our community um, and all of the different um, 
walks of life and different types of people that we have and how, you know, how are certain, how are certain groups showing up more in data or um, than others are not. And so those are questions that we are constantly asking ourselves, but then also working on projects that um, try and address some of that. So, you know, one of the biggest, um, like having this barrier of, you know, how data is collected and the quality of it, um, one of the biggest kind of impacts that, you know, you can refer to is the census. So with the census and, you know, that being a very timely conversation with all of the release and things happening right now, I mean, this is data that's collected that especially in our public affairs nonprofit world, like there's billions of dollars that are getting funded, you know, based on this survey that's taken every 10 years, right? And so there's a huge kind of understanding that needs to happen on really a statistical kind of level and an analysis on where there's undercounting kind of happening within the census. And, you know, our organization isn't the only one having this conversation, um, but particularly, I think when you're talking about um, racial equity and trying to make that a goal of yours, with regardless of what industry you're in, it's really important to kind of try and pick that kind of undercount. So like, you know, one of the things that we're doing um, within the redistricting process that happens following um, the census and that approach and everything, having an understanding of undercount and being able to produce reports for that is kind of where um, you can, you know, draw these districts and these levels more accurately to represent communities for the next 10 years, which is just kind of wild to think about that impact that goes on for a decade. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just to reiterate, like data disaggregation is huge and it starts from being able to kind of understand what that disaggregation needs to look like um, and where some of this undercounting, you know, happens in the political kind of sphere, um, you know, especially this time around when we had the census, there were so many barriers from digital access. There were so many barriers from just people who, you know, their health was not in a place where they, you know, were focused on the census. They, they had the least number of people employed and being able to go out and get, um, you know, the uh, like, um, the numbers for the survey and all of these different things. So there's just so much. And historically, we've seen that, you know, the communities that tend to be undercounted are also the communities that are minority underrepresented. Um, and so it's just, yeah, con thinking about data disaggregation, I think is huge in your um, data sets. The classic data equity issue, like who's represented in your data and who's not, and especially something as impactful as the census. That's that's really scary um, to think about the implications of that and the funding in the next 10 years, um, as you mentioned. Thanks for that, Maria. Um, so I can chime in to about <clears throat> some of the things that we've seen not really work from a corporate perspective. Um, and, and this applies honestly, not just to data equity initiatives, but also to broader diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives that corporations are trying to implement within their organizations. Um, a lot of people want to go about it as kind of a bolt on effort, um, separate from their core company goals and values when it, it really cannot be done like that. It has to be built into the core business strategies. Um, the core company values, and then especially when you're starting to look at um, data ethics, then the values also then have to be reflected back into that. And I, I think in the past um, couple of years, um, there's been a lot of companies that have committed to um, different diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, um, and then their actions have not reflected that, um, or they've uh, backed away from the goals that they've set. Um, so we really wanted to avoid that when we were working on building out our own strategies. So um, like I was mentioning before, we started really on the education level. And then from there, we um, started a, a steering committee and got key stakeholders involved, uh, executive sponsorship. Um, Cindy Lynn did a great session yesterday going into detail too about how she went about this at Hop, Skip, Drive. And I found a lot of parallels um, between our strategies. So I definitely recommend um, checking out her session on demand um, if you guys have the time or interest in that. Um, but after we got our executive sponsorship, then we were able to 
uh, really build out a project charter and identify the different areas and pillars that we wanted to uh, work on from a data equity perspective. And um, one thing that was really important to us as well was to look at not only externally, like how we're gonna implement this into the products that we develop, um, the technology we develop and the services that we provide to our clients, but um, also we were looking at um, how are we going to be implementing this internally so that um, we're able to show that we're using these same uh, frameworks and this uh, data equity mindset on our own internal data. Um, talking about supplier diversity, talking about uh, the diversity of our staff in particular. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to say that we were doing that internally as well. And um, what all of this also enabled was the ability to look um, on a U.S. level, um, because there were a lot of initiatives that were already happening, a lot of data equity projects that were already in place, but it was happening on a project by project level, uh, on a localized level. Um, so then once you are able to establish executive sponsorship and really outline your company values and goals pertaining to it, um, then you're able to start um, looking at those different initiatives and start bringing them up to that corporate level um, to get more traction or development on a further level. Um, and, and kind of finally, um, one consideration for us as well is as a global company, um, there are different regulations surrounding data allowances, um, the collection of data, the uh, utilization of data, the building of algorithms, depending on the country. Um, so when we're building out our values, be it for d &I initiatives or be it for data equity initiatives, um, we're also making sure that there's that availability for um, different uh, offices then to localize that to what is uh, pertinent in their local market, as well as um, what is, you know, legally allowed, let's say, in, the, in their market or um, what makes sense for the country that they're working in. Um, so having a, a core strong uh, structure that reflects your company values and is really ingrained in your core business strategies is so important to make sure that you're able to actually execute on the promises that you made in terms of data equity. Yeah, I think the conversation around values is really important because of course you've got a, a kind of legal baseline that you know may vary based on where you're geographically located, but I think that, that's sort of the, the floor and not the ceiling of what we wanna be doing um, in the data equity space. And so, um, so Catherine, maybe we can dive a little bit more into this conversation. So maybe we can start with you um, for this one, but how do we, if we're thinking about ourselves here at DataCon as a community of data practitioners, you know, regardless of our industry, our field, or our specific role, what can we do to kind of hold ourselves accountable um, to better data practices? Yeah, definitely. So um, like I was um, speaking about too, uh, once, once I brought um, our data equity program up more to the corporate level alongside my coworker, uh, Johan Sparrett, um, once we brought more to the corporate level, we were able to start getting um, the regular committee meetings. And so that ensures that we're able to make regular progress going forward. Um, and then offering a transparency as well to the staff, particularly when we're looking at data equity goals surrounding um, diversity, uh, staff diversity, offering transparency there is a way to allow for um, employees then to hold the corporation accountable for the promises that's made. Um, and on a, on a broader scale, looking outside of um, just what I do, um, I, I thought about this a lot. I don't know if we'll ever see true transparency when it comes to the big data algorithms um, because they're considered proprietary, they're considered the secret sauce. Um, so I don't know that we'll ever see true transparency, but there has to be at minimum um, a level of auditability. Um, uh, some of the other panelists have talked already, uh, especially Ebony, about um, some of the ways that these algorithms are already in place uh, harming real people. Um, and there's, for instance, one algorithm I was reading about that um, was recommending that teachers be fired um, from a school district. And when the teachers were asking, well, how is this decision made? My, my reviews were really great. Um, everyone's always loved me. How did an algorithm decide that I needed to be fired? Um, they weren't able to even give her an answer as to why. Um, and, and really having a sense of auditability and explainability surrounding the algorithms. And of course, there's another discussion altogether about if we should let an algorithm decide whether or not um, somebody is fired unilaterally. Um, but, but at minimum, um, there should be a factor of auditability surrounding that so that when people ask, how is this decision made? 
there's an answer that's able to be provided to them um, and not just the um, kind of safety blanket of saying, well, it's proprietary, we can't share that information. Um, that's, not, that's not right and not acceptable. I certainly think none of us would find it personally access, uh, you know, acceptable if a, a decision about our employment status was made via algorithm with no explanation, I don't think. Anyone here or anyone listening to this would, would consider that an acceptable outcome. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely with you there. Um, yeah, but what, uh, kind of the rest of our panel, um, if you all kind of want to chime in um, on this accountability piece, like what can we do as a community? Um, what can we do at kind of a larger level to, to hold ourselves accountable? I think from this, hmm. I think from the city's perspective, um, just being really transparent about our methodology whenever we're working with data and we're using data to justify a decision. Um, so, you know, things that come to mind are, you know, our rental assistance programs and, you know, how are, how are we deciding who gets selected and or which neighborhoods get prioritized in the distribution of those funds. So just being really um, transparent about um, the methodology behind those decisions is, is key um, to holding ourselves accountable. And I also think that, um, you know, just ensuring that whenever we do uh, do analysis that it leads to policy change um, or program change, you know, that we're making adjustments based on those findings. Uh, and I think that's more of like an internal accountability mechanism, but um, that's really key as well. Um, great point, Ava. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about um, relative to accountability specifically in healthcare um, was one, thinking about the information that we um, collect and the fact that in healthcare, you have the likelihood of operating either in electronic world or a paper world. Um, and so really thinking about um, data um, from, from the perspective of volume, variety, veracity, velocity, and value, um, and knowing that that's very, very different in an electronic world versus a paper world. Um, and then really applying um, sort of the concept of information governance um, to um, both worlds. Um, and information governance really is just that framework that exists um, to help organizations sort of manage information or data through its life cycle um, while supporting um, sort of the organization's strategic um, operations um, as well as sort of the regulatory and legal um, and risk aspects of, um, of the work as well. Um, but beyond that, um, like really getting into the nuts and bolts of accountability, um, I think that we have to have some accountability for what gets measured, right? Um, and as I alluded to earlier, what gets measured gets improved. Um, but in healthcare, the thing that gets measured is also the thing that is incentivized. Um, because in a lot of ways we've moved um, into this pay for performance um, um, reality um, where a lot of things hinge on the metrics that you can provide um, and demonstrate that you are collecting this information and shown improvement, et cetera, et cetera. And so we really have to create, create accountability around the things that we're measuring um, and then make sure that we're selecting um, metrics that are appropriate. Um, what are the things that we really should be looking at? And then communicating about the data that we're collecting um, in the most respectful manner possible. Um, so those were a couple of the things that um, really stood out to me when thinking about accountability um, relative to how we handle data and really integrate data and the equity and ethics components of data um, relative to healthcare. Um, yeah, I think accountability is such an important conversation to have. And I really love this question because especially when we're going to talk about things like trust and equity, right? It can't just be something that's like written in your mission statement, right? It can't just be this phrase that we're continuously kind of throwing out around, right? So we really have to kind of start digging deep and talk, talk about like how that's kind of 
applicable and what does that look like? And there's you know great examples that each one of the speakers here have provided within um, my work and you know with my organization at Advancement Project California. One of the things that I have really think that has kind of like elevated our data data like equity practices is inviting the communities that we're working with or working for or gathering data on to be a part of that process of um, data processing, data visualization, kind of thinking in the mindset of like a UX researcher, you know, and so we are always working with community based organizations throughout kind of our process, not just kind of at the end, right? Like when you've kind of like come up with whatever your deliverables or outcomes are. And the results of that um, can really elevate, I think, the work that you're doing. So, you know, for example, one of the first projects um, that I worked on in the beginning of the year um, was working with a community that was um, dealing with a crisis in, um, in an environmental crisis. There was a lot of asthma that this community um, is dealing with, with, you know, children and adults. And there's just a lot, it's a very polluted part of the city. Um, and so, you know, while we were looking at um, the kind of standards that, you know, we could find from Cal Environment and um, getting data from all of these different, like, you know, respectable sources, one of the other things that we were able to do, which I think was really great, is we were also collecting data from the community itself of where points that they felt, you know, geographically, this is where we know the pollution is really bad. You know, like I, I can't take my child to this park because I know that there's a, you know, a, a, a freeway here where there's many trucks that are constantly passing by and, and the pollution here is really bad. And that's the kind of, you know, it, it almost um, it kind of flips data a little bit on its head. You know, it, it starts instead of data becoming about people, it's like people, you know, becoming uh, like, kind of uh, giving the data instead. So um, that was a really great way to kind of do that. Um, another like quick example of that is, you know, um, a project that we just kind of wrapped up in um, um, had to do with the areas of um, central Long Beach in that area. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but the second largest Cambodian community outside of Cambodia is in Long Beach. So there's this huge, you know, population um, there in this like beautiful community there. And so when we are, you know, producing these reports on the populations there in the community there, we wanted to make sure that was accessible. So like after speaking to them, we were able to get partners to help us basically translate um, the work that we were doing all in Khmer, um, which is the, the native language for the primary language, you know, for Cambodians. Um, and so that's giving a whole nother kind of layer of accessibility um, that, you know, you don't have, you, that you're not going to necessarily have um, otherwise. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think it was Catherine who touched on transparency and that's kind of where transparency is so important in accountability, because when you're that transparent, then you are almost opening yourself up to be accountable to all of those people that now have access to, you know, the work that you're kind of producing. And then lastly, I think I want to say on kind of a larger scale, you know, being someone who has this like policy background, I, I can't like not speak to this. Um, but I think we do have to start thinking about data protection on a very like federal national level you know we have these like epa standards where are our data standards like where's the data protection agency you know and and it, maybe you know here in the us when we talk about these things they sound very like oh we're trying to do something so big and out of the norm but if you just you know look across to other democracies in the world you know for example if you're looking at like um, the European Union, like they have a general data protection regulation agency, you know, and as a part of that, they also have um, DPAs, which are data protection authorities, um, following up on, you know, okay, we have these set of regulations that we've set for data and AI, but are we actually enforcing it? Are we implementing it. And I think that's really important. I think there's a lot of really great work um, starting to kind of come out on the federal level. You know, I, I don't want to like dismiss that. Um, you know, just this past January, I think Congress passed the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, you know, which basically is an institute that's going to start researching on um, what are the, you know, um, regulations that need to be have had for like AI and, you know, 
critiquing kind of the the AI that um, is affecting all of these different lives. Um, and I think that's great. It's a great place to start with research, um, but definitely there needs to be follow up with kind of um, implementation and follow through with, you know, how is it actually being um, enforced? And I, and I think it's important. I mean, just look at the conversation that we're having today. You know, AI and data is impacting your health. It's impacting, you know, the funding that communities are getting. It's impacting, you know, everyday lives in so many ways. So um, I do think we have to start thinking bigger about it. Maria, I think you brought up two really good points about access. I mean, I think one is the kind of participatory point that you mentioned and taking some of these principles from the UX design world and how can we engage our, our end user and all of our stakeholders into the process. I think that's super important. And I think that the kind of data and design worlds have a lot to learn from each other um, around that piece and how do we make that kind of a more standard practice. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned, um, particularly about the kind of giving data back to the hands of, of the people, you know, for whom it's relevant. Um, one of the keynotes this morning was talking about power um, as the ability to take action. And so I think it's a really cool example when you said, you know, we're giving data back to um, our, these kind of stakeholders, these community members so that they can decide, I don't wanna take my kid to this particular park because I know that the outcome might be worse. For me, that's power because they're, they're the one who has the ability to make that decision. And it's not sort of hidden away in some kind of, uh, you know, file or something that's, that's being kept in, in internal to an organization. So um, I just, I really like those two points that you made um, as we're thinking about accessibility, um, which is a huge part of equity. Um, so I think we're seeing some questions come into the audience Q&A. So I think we're going to pivot um, to some audience questions for a bit. So if you've been sitting in the audience, if you have a question and you haven't typed it in yet, please do so. Um, but let's start with some of the ones that have already been coming in. Um, so we've got one from Jen um, related to Ebony's remarks. Um, and Jen says, I have seen that sometimes communities we need to support the most in terms of equity um, are also hesitant for many good reasons to share their data. Any solves? So um, I think sounds like this question is about uh, maybe communities who are already underrepresented or, or marginalized in a variety of ways. Um, it's hard to get data. Maybe there's there's kind of some lack of trust there. Um, Ebony, I don't know if you want to start with this one or if anyone else wants to wants to chime in. Sure. Um, thanks, Jen, for the question. Um, I think, um, as we've talked about um, pretty much throughout the entire discussion, um, trust is the component um, or the key ingredient, right? Um, it's difficult to pull information from places um, that have not um, been treated fairly. Um, over time. And so when you think about communities, um, particularly those that are marginalized um, in many ways, um, they have, um, their trust has been eroded um, in the system and what the system is um, created or designed to do for them. Um, so I think one of the solutions is really that you have to start by building that trust back, um, but you also have to create um, platforms that allow their voices to truly be heard. Um, and so that comes in a variety of ways, um, but creating that allows them then to um, willingly want to share um, information um, that they haven't been so forthcoming in sharing before. Um, I think Maria mentioned um, when she was talking about the census, um, oftentimes we see um, that those are the same communities that continue to be underrepresented, un underrepresented over time. Um, and one of the reasons is that they just don't even complete the census because they don't feel that it makes a difference. Um, but again, in that um, or inherent in that um, belief is a lack of trust again. Um, and I think it ties directly to when we think about healthcare, sort of those social determinants of health um, that exist um, and health is impacted. Um, everything is impacted because of poor schools. Um, poor water, poor this, poor that. Um, but those are things that have been created over time. Um, and so the solution is, again, building the trust and creating a bridge um, that those individuals want to want to cross. Um, they have to choose to cross the bridge um, and begin to open up and share the information that is needed to make the necessary improvements. And I don't think that we get to um, the data that we need until we create that. Um, so I hope that answers your question in some way, Jen. 
I certainly think trust is huge. Um, and Ebony, that kind of makes me um, think to tie back to what Maria just mentioned, which is kind of at, at what level are we talking about, right? Like a specific organization, of course, with your constituents, you want to build that trust with policies, with transparency, communication, you know, all the tools that you have. Um, but also at a larger level, there is kind of this role that that policy or a, a kind of a broader stance can play to help build trust. I think a lot about um, nutrition labels is something that we talk about in our data equity workshops. And so, you know, I don't think any of us would walk into a grocery store and buy cereal that didn't have uh, a list on the side of the ingredients because it would be um, a little bit scary to think about anything that could be in a processed food um, unless it was going to be listed on a label. So you can look there, especially if you're a person that has maybe food allergies, right? That's information is going to be super important to you and you're going to pay a lot of attention and you're not going to choose um, to sort of engage with something unless you know exactly what's in it. And I think there's sort of a parallel to be drawn um, with data and with kind of standards more broadly and having someone to enforce um, kind of any, any regulations that we can put in place. Um, Awesome. Any other thoughts on the kind of how do we um, kind of bring folks along on the kind of uh, hesitation piece? Um, any other thoughts on that before we jump to the next audience question? Um, I want to say I know we're like talking a lot about um, the ways data can go bad um, and we need to. Right. It's an important conversation to have. But I think in some ways, it's also, you know, how data can be that supportive tool as well. You know, when we, a, a lot of the reason that, you know, this, there's almost this like trust deficit in a way that happens um, is because they haven't seen their voices be heard. And data is really powerful in the sense that like people listen to what these numbers have to say because we have been trained to think that, you know, numbers are facts. And so when you start giving these data tools and these data um, products to underrepresented voices, hopefully that, you know, amplifies their voices and allows them to engage in civic processes and political processes and, and any other processes with, um, you know, a little bit more in their toolbox. Um, and while, what they their experiences should be more than enough, you know, to be a part of that. Um, data is a way that can kind of elevate it. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it gets the attention of the people um, who are stakeholders um, than what just, you know, someone's experiences would. That's a great point. Um, Wonderful. So I think let's now jump to our next question um, in the audience. Thank you, Jen, for that first one. Um, this question is from Brian Blackwell. Great points, Jen and Ava. Tech companies have access to petabytes of data, lots of data, uh, large quantities we're talking about here. Um, but community activists often struggle to get access to data at all. How do we address, the, address these disparities? Data is power. Agree. Um, who wants to start with that one? I'm happy to jump into that one. I think that's a great question and um, something that we think a lot about on the open data team uh, in the city of Los Angeles. So, um, you know, my team manages the open data portal. We have tons of data related to everything from, you know, COVID stats to, you know, street paving. Um, and I think one of the realizations we had is that not everybody has the technical ability to like, you know, export a spreadsheet and, you know, plug it into visualization software and figure out the insight or tease out the insights that they're looking for. Um, so that that is a real barrier and a real obstacle. And, um, and so that's why, you know, we've done a couple of things to address this. So we started this new role within our neighborhood council system called the data liaison role. Um, and we held, uh, we created a whole, you know, education program around this. So these data liaisons met once a month with us and we would walk them through workshops on how to manipulate data for community insights. And we would always like lead with, you know, what questions do you want answered? Like, we'll help you find the data um, and we'll help you, you know, plug it into a dashboard or a web map so that you can get the answers that you're looking for. And so I think from a structural or an institution level standpoint, that's a great program because it's, you know, building the data capacity of the neighborhood council system, which is like the closest layer 
to the people. It's uh, their 99 different neighborhood councils. Um, so that was one program that we did. Um, and then another one, we worked on this um, app called Know Your Community that just has insight, basically like insight ready. Uh, it, it was an insight ready app so that you could just figure out, like answer your most basic questions about your community. Um, and we did a lot of user research around that app. So we met with um, community-based organizations and neighborhood council members to figure out like what are the most common questions that residents have about their community um, and just how we just deliver those insights um, so that folks don't have to go through the trouble of analyzing, crunching, and visualizing data. So just my two cents, um, I think those community engagement workshops are key and then just having insight ready tools or products out there is, is really key as well. Thank you, Ava. I love the approach that you're sharing of kind of coming at it from both sides. So both helping folks build skills to access what's available, but also building things that are more accessible and maybe require a little bit less sort of technical knowledge up front. I think both sides of that are super important. Um, fabulous. Um, I think unless anyone else has any other thoughts on the kind of community access to sort of institutional data question, I think we'll jump to the next one. Um, cool, which is, um, Ava, maybe this is sort of a jumping off point um, from what you were just talking about, um, but we have a question from Chris. It says, um, Ava, can you talk more about how you see the role the open data portals play in the data equity conversation? And as a follow-up, um, how do you decide what data sets to put on the portal? Yeah, I think the open data portal definitely plays a role in the data equity conversation. I think it's a way, um, I think it's a way for city departments to be transparent about um, some of the programs or the services that they're managing and who's getting access to it and, and you know, just what's happening with those programs. Um, so it's, it's important for us from a transparency standpoint. Um, but also I think you know, it's a great way for us to, you know, hold ourselves accountable. Um, I think that a lot of times you can, you know, you could start to question like, how are we distributing these resources? Is it based on need? Is it based on request? And how can we build in better systems? Um, so yeah, I think the open data portal plays a huge role in the data equity conversation. But I also, like I said earlier, I think that there's room for improvement. I think that, you know, it's not accessible to everyone. Not everyone's a researcher or, you know, is familiar or comfortable enough with technology to manipulate it. Um, so, you know, doing the work of engaging with community-based organizations, engaging with advocacy groups, with activists, um, and figuring out, like, what, what are they concerned about? What, what information do they want? And how can we present that in a really accessible way? Um, that's part of our job. Um, and I think that that's basically how we go about um, our work. Um, so just through those conversations, figuring out what those most salient topics are and just working with the departments to open data and around those topics um, and create some visualizations and insights around those topics. Um, so I'll never say like, we're done, it's always a work in progress and there's always room for improvement. Um, but that's generally the approach. Awesome, thank you, Ava. Interesting to hear a little bit more about how that sort of, the inner workings of that. Um, cool, we have another question that just popped in from Alex. Um, so this question is, statistical misinterpretation of data has historically perpetuated inequity in marginalized communities. Yes, I think we've been talking about that a little bit so far. Um, how do you practice data equity when translating data into insights that drive policy change? Um, super interesting question. Thank you, Alex. Um, I don't know who wants to chime in on this. Maria, Ebony. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll take the first stab at it, Rachel. Um, I think one of the ways um, is to one, acknowledge that interpretation bias is really a thing. Um, and then two, I think having the ability to view data or the results um, that we use um, to drive policy, 
has to be considered from a variety of perspectives. So from a social perspective, a cultural perspective, mathematical, historical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think by doing that, then we lessen um, the likelihood that we have um, sort of introduced um, potential inequities um, into our interpretation of the information that we're using and thus creating um, policies um, that further drive um, inequity. Um, so it, that's my two cents in terms of ways that maybe we could practice data equity to reduce that. And when you're, you mentioned at the beginning, Ebony, um, interpretation bias, I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about that. That might be um, a bit of a newer term for some folks. Sure. So interpretation bias is really simply um, the fact that um, the data itself or the interpre interpretation of the data um, is inevitably subjective, right? Um, so I, as the interpreter, am going to sort of place my own um, views um, kind of front and center. Um, and one of the things that we know is that we don't have, our facts don't just accumulate, right, um, on blank slates. Um, researchers come to the table um, sort of with their own inherent biases, right? Um, and that's kind of why we consider it to be unconscious in a way, right? Um, because we're not thinking about it, we don't view ourselves as biased, but we can have sort of the data which we think is objective, but we've already said, um, we said at the beginning of this talk that data is not truly objective. Um, and so you add to that a person who is then interpret interpreting that information and they bring with it their own experiences and worldviews. And so it creates sort of this bias um, in the interpretation of the information. And as a result, um, you have sort of science um, or data coupled with um, this newly introduced interpretation bias. Um, and we really don't know that that has happened um, until hindsight, mm -hmm. um, actually. Um, it's hard to see it up front. Um, but once we realize it, we know that maybe we've now created sort of um, this conduit for systematic error. Um, that now exists. So that's really what I mean when I speak of interpretation bias is that the individuals who are who are responsible for um, sort of interpreting um, the data and information and thus making decisions um, bring to the table sort of their own um, perspectives um, and lens through which they see and view things and ultimately would interpret things. And so again, to lessen that, if we look at the data from a variety of perspectives, that's one way to sort of um, call that um, interpretation bias, if you will. Yeah, so we're talking about layers here, right? We're talking about the layer yes. of the data itself, how the data even got created. And then even yes. once we get past all those yes. layers, we've got this layer around who's interpreting it, um, how are they interpreting it, how many people got a chance to kind of interpret it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. that's a really Maybe. great point. And I think just auditing your assumptions too is key. Um, I mean, algorithms are opinions embedded into math. And so some of our assumptions when we're deciding what to weight or what to prioritize, sometimes we need to examine those further. You know, like there are historical and institutional barriers that certain groups face in accessing, you know, healthcare or, you know, you know, that's just one example, healthcare, for example, um, that will show up in the data. And so you think you're creating a neutral model that is blind, you know, but it's not. I mean, there there are very real patterns that have a history behind them that will emerge in that data. And so I think it's really important to check yourself and check your assumptions um, because a lot of times, you know, you're not as unbiased and neutral as you think you are. Assumptions are a huge part of it. Ava, I'm really glad that you brought that up. I feel like that comes up almost every time we talk about this, any kind of hypothesis you're making about data, any um, kind of any anything you're assuming about it, right, can be a potential area where you there's kind of a lot of layers of inequity built in and it's you can it can be easy to not realize it um, unless you sort of check them all in a systematic way. Rachel, I wanted to just go back to something that Ava just said um, in terms of assumptions and, and really kind of bringing uh, the healthcare example um, to light because wh what I heard when she was saying that too um, was embedded somewhere in that is sort of the structural racism that exists um, and sort of the institutional racism that continues to be perpetuated, right, um, in healthcare. And so again, for those communities, 
um, for which we lack data or um, may not have as much data as we would like um, to sort of create programs and make decisions, part of that is, uh, is as a result of some of the things that have occurred in healthcare through history um, that have led those individuals to be reluctant, right, or hesitant to um, really share or participate um, in trials and research and all the other things or just answer basic questions even when they go to the doctor's office um, because those things seem to have been forgotten. Um, but um, history tells us that, I mean, even the Tuskegee experiment, for example, um, is one that that wasn't that long ago. Um, that ended in 1972. Um, some of us were probably born um, at that time. And so it's not as historical as one might think. Um, and so thinking about those things, again, it's not just the assumptions, but it's um, reality of certain situations that have occurred, um, particularly when you bring sort of a healthcare example um, to the forefront, that these are things that are real and still exist today um, that are kind of eroding um, individuals' ability to want um, to sort of be um, forthcoming um, and sharing data or information um, about their personal lives and their personal selves. But that limitation in the data um, really hinders our ability to drive policy um, change in the most effective way. Goes right back to trust, um, as we were talking about before, right? If the trust has been eroded, it's, you know, checking a few assumptions is not going to be sufficient, right? That's, that's a deeper, that's a deeper problem. Um, thank you, Ebony, for, for that addition. Um, all right, we've got another question um, from Brian, which says, uh, data collection is a complex social and historical process. Yes, agree. Um, should we be hiring more people with qualitative historical research skills into data positions or collaborating with data scientists? Interesting. So it seems like this question is a little bit about how do we kind of solve for this sort of skill or kind of knowledge need around this um, topic. Ava, do you want to kick us off for this one? Yeah, I'll give my two cents and then I, I'm sure I think Maria would have a lot to say on this too. I know she works a lot in this space, um, but I, I feel like having that historical knowledge um, is really important um, whenever you're working with data. So just understanding, you know, you know, data is not neutral. There will sometimes be skewness in the data or just different patterns uh, among different communities that emerge that will show up in the data. Um, and there's historical reasons behind that. Um, and so I, I think it's very important to have that context and understanding um, whenever you're working with data and you're creating a bias, uh, you're creating an algorithm or a decision-making tool based upon that data. Um, so I think that context uh, and that history is, mm -hmm. is key to understanding. Maria, I'll pop one Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask the conversation. Um, for sure. I mean, you know, we do work a lot with kind of grassroots community organizations, and we're constantly trying to make our work and data more accessible. And so we're kind of, you know, thinking about that, that question that was just asked by Brian a lot. And we're thinking about what that kind of means. And I, and it's kind of, you know, it, in one sense, like, yes, like, let's invite more people with that, like, qualitative, you know, research set to be a part of the conversation. But in another way, I would all also advocate for it's not necessarily that the people that have the qualitative skills need to learn quantitative skills. I think it's more ownership on the people who um, have the quantitative skills and are producing, you know, data products and deliverables from a quantitative mindset are being cognizant of the qualitative data pieces that are missing. Um, and I think it's um, on, you know, it's an it's an ownership in that sense of the community of data scientists to be engaging with those kinds of activists that can bring amazing qualitative, you know, supplements to the work that you're doing. Um, you know, so one of the things that, you know, for example, that we've done is um, we, you know, produced this report. And as a part of that report, um, myself and another analyst, we were, you know, we were looking at the numbers and they were just, and one of the things we were analyzing was um, looking at um, early child care um, and looking at early child care facilities, especially when you're thinking of the pandemic and 
you know, all of the the craziness that, you know, unfortunately, these really hardworking people have ha had to go through in this past year is really tough. And you're looking at some really like bleak and dark numbers. But we also wanted to highlight how like these communities stood up for each other, you know, like these like, you know, workers in the child care industry, like they were facing the pandemic on the front lines and experiencing it in a whole different way than, you know, a lot of us were. Um, and so we brought in stories throughout our report, incorporated kind of doing community spotlights, highlighting this work. And, and I think, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking about, um, you know, some of my favorite activists. And when I think of like, you know, Cesar Chavez and, you know, he, he's an activist that I love and I, I think about his movement and I'm, you know, he didn't need data to, you know, have that, have that movement happen. Right. So it's not necessarily that like, data is some like necessary evil or something, you know, we need to have as a part of like the mix. But, um, you know, it's important to point out, you know, when these activists are, are looking to kind of promote equity, how can this new kind of world that's emerging of having so much more information on communities that sometimes, you know, maybe have been even invisible before that are, you know, lack voices in these spaces, like, how can we aid you know, those movements and how can we be a part of those? Um, and I'll also say like, you know, there's a lot of grassroots organizations that um, have used data as a tool and have been using it for years before it was a conversation that we were having at, you know, a fancy conference in 2021. You know, when you um, think about the Black Panthers um, and, and that, um, you know, society, they um, they have been known to be like one of the first like demographers, you know, like they did a really good job of documenting where their communities were and what they were experiencing, which is not something that was really being done well at all back then. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a, a you know, like I I don't think there's necessarily anything um negative about bringing those like qualitative um, researchers in to the quantitative piece. But I also think that um, there needs to be a little bit more outreaching from the quantitative um, scientists. Thank you so much for that, Maria. Um, we've gotten some awesome questions. So I just want to say thank you to our audience for having all of these great questions for us. Um, we do have one sort of final question I wanted to wrap on our kind of our discussion on today, um, which is that hopefully for all of you listening, um, this has kind of piqued your interest in data equity. I think it's brought up some really good questions um, and some ideas. And so I'd like to kind of make sure we're bringing that over into action. And so I'd like each of our panelists to just speak a little bit about one actionable step that they that you would each recommend um, to folks who are interested in diving into this after our panel today. Um, so let's see, Maria, maybe we can start with you for this one. Sure. And so you want me to just kind of touch upon um, one place to kind of start in bringing. In, OK, um, yeah. yeah. Sure. And I, I think, you know, um, this might be a little bit of a reiteration of some things I've said before, um, but I think it really starts with asking who, you know, who is your data about? And then from there, kind of trying to learn about that community. You know, Ebony and Ava did such a good job in that previous conversation talking about kind of the systematic racism that exists, all of the institutional biases. Um, and those are very real things happening that are affecting people every single day. And so I think, you know, asking who's behind the data set that you're looking at and trying to learn about those communities on all different levels. Like, I, I think that's where it needs to start. Um, and I, and I, yeah, that's where I would recommend you kind of begin your data equity um, journey. Um, I'll just say, um, I think individuals just need to educate themselves on what data equity really is. Um, and what it means in the space in which they operate um, most often. Um, I also just wanted to say that for me, I'm a reader, so I like to read. And so a couple of things that I've read um, that were helpful on this journey um, as I thought about data um, and looked at it very differently. Um, and one of those is The Ethical Algorithm um, by Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth. Um, I think that's a good book to read. Um, another thing to read is sort of a, a paper from the Chicago Beyond Equity series, um, which is called Why Am I Being Researched? 
Um, and so it really kind of is an eye-opening um, read in terms of thinking about um, why we do some of the things we do, how we've done them, um, and sort of the way forward. Um, and then lastly, if you have any specific interest in healthcare, um, I think I mentioned this paper um, early on um, in one of my responses, but it was just released um, last week. Um, it's from the National Academy of Medicine, and it's an equity agenda for the field of healthcare quality improvement. Um, and you can find that on their website. But it's a pretty lengthy read, but it's well worth it um, if you have interest in healthcare to kind of see where some of those gaps exist um, and how we're going to be able to move forward in terms of closing sort of the health equity gap. Um, so just reading um, and really educating yourself um, in the space that you're in um, is my recommendation. Thanks, Ebony. I was Googling as you were get, listing <laughs> all of those sources. So I have many tabs open now. Um, I guess my, my, my recommendation, I'm gonna come at this from a governance standpoint. I think um, it would be great at your or respective organizations if you could create a uh, data ethics committee and just start to you know, check yourselves, you know, review your methodology, uh, challenge some of your assumptions, um, or even just have a forum for discussion around, you know, how you're building that methodology and whether it's the right approach. Um, and I think that that forum or that body could also be a great body for discussing other da data ethics issues. Um, so that's my recommendation. I think every organization should have a, a, you know, some sort of a committee like that. And um, I'll just echo some of what Ebony was saying about the importance of education. Um, there's a documentary, which I believe is still on Netflix right now. It's called Coded Bias. Um, it's a really great look at some of the algorithmic injustice that's currently present um, within our world. And um, also during the course of that documentary, they do interview several experts within the field. So you can really go down a rabbit hole from there, reading all of their books as well and research into this topic. Um, and if you're more of a hands-on learner, I, of course, recommend the LA Tech for Good ethical and equitable data workshop or a similar workshop if you're not um, able to attend that one, um, just because that gives you a really great set of hands-on tools um, to look at how to start implementing this in your workspace. Fabulous. I think those are all great and all complimentary, right? We've got some kind of self-education, kind of self-directed learning. We've got um, some kind of building, bringing folks together at your organization. Um, and of course, we would love to see some of you at a future LA Tech for Good workshop, or we'd love to help you bring um, something to your organization. I'll drop a link in the chat with more info about that. Please feel free to reach out to us if that's something you're interested in. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our fabulous audience. Thank you so much for all your questions. It's always fun as a panel to get um, some real, some good questions on a variety of topics. And I, I think we got that here today. So um, thanks so much, everyone. Well, um, and, and thank you, Rachel and uh, Maria, Ebony, Catherine, Eva. I really enjoyed this panel and, uh, and uh, we really appreciate you being part of DataCon LA 2021. Um, I, it's great to see you all talk and, and really highlight the, the gaps, uh, the data gaps and the ways to improve equity that, that we have remaining to do, but, but I, but I see you all as representing the work that is being done. Um, and that's very exciting and uh, inspiring. So uh, thank you. Audience, like audience here, uh, there'll be a link in the, uh, in the chat box. So uh, we appreciate your feedback uh, about this panel. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, have a wonderful day and, uh, and thanks for being part of DataCon LA. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.